we are good to go live right now, inshallah. Yes. Okay, inshallah. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Udu'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wa mau'izati hasana wa jadilhum bilatihi ya'asan. Rabbi shuli sari wa yasili amri wa ahli udata milisani yafqaw kawli. Respected elders, respected brothers and sisters in Islam and in humanity, I would like to welcome every one of you with the Islamic greeting. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May peace, mercy and blessing of Allah, the Almighty God, be upon all of you. Alhamdulillah, today I was invited and to share with you a very important topic. And the topic, as you guys can see uh, at the poster, is effective communications in da'wah and the importance of it. So before I begin to talk about effective communications, brothers and sisters, let's analyze and let's look at how important for us as a Muslim to do da'wah. There are numerous verses and hadith where Allah and His Messenger is commanding us to do da'wah, to be involved in da'wah and to make it as part of our life. One of the words is in Surah Ali Imran, chapter number 3, verse 110, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kuntum kaira ummati ukrija linas, ta'muruna bi ma'ruf, wa tanhawna anil munkar, wa tu'minuna bila. Which means that you are the best of nation, evolve for mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we are the best of nations, evolve for mankind. We are not the second best, we are not the third best, but we are the best the best of nations. But let us be very honest, be brutally honest with ourselves. Does the Muslim today look like the best of nations? I believe that you and me have the answer. We do not look like the best of nations. Not because what Allah say is wrong, but because we have a misunderstanding about the Quran, and as well, we do not fulfill the conditions to be the best of Muslims, to be the best of nations. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you, we, as a Muslim, are the best of nations, kuntum kaira ummati ukri jalinas, now, there is a catch. Just for example, if we are being given the honor that we are the best student, we are the best perfect, okay? We are the best employee in our organizations, in the company that we work in. Now, it just, that honor didn't come just because of who we are, but it is because of what we have done. So therefore, in order for us to become the best and to become the best of the best and to become the best evolve for mankind, what should we do? And Imam Mashaukani Rahimahullah in his book, Fat Qadir, the Tafsir, where he do the interpretations, the Tafsir of this ayah, he says that yes, verily, as a Muslim, the Muslim are the best of nations, evil for mankind. No doubt about it. But he continued and he said, as long as the Muslims are fulfilling the terms and conditions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the verse, which is, ta'muruna bi ma'ruf wa tanhawna anin munkar wa tu'minuna bila, which means that you enjoin what is right and you forbid the evil and tu'minuna bila, and you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we talk about tu'minuna bila, inshallah, as a Muslim, inshallah, inshallah, we have it, inshallah. But then, when we talk about Ta'muruna bi ma'ruf to enjoin what is right. Do we do it? Do we make it part and parcel of our life? How many times? How often do we enjoy what is right? Do we call people to prayers? Do we go call people to do good? Do we call people to Allah? And indeed, we say a lot of things every day. Every day, 
we talk to a lot of people, multi, a lot of to different, different topics. But do we talk about Allah? Do we talk about Islam? Do we invite them to become a Muslim? Well, for some of us, we might thought that how can it possible for me to talk about Islam every day? Now, let's not talk about it about every day. But how about you might have known this colleague of yours or a friend of yours for years, maybe three, four years, five years, six years. Now, in that period of time, how many times do we talk about Allah? How many times do you introduce Islam to them? Right? So we should be very frank with ourselves. And just imagine, brothers and sisters, if which is the easier part out of the two part, which is to enjoy what is right, and yet we fail to do it, then what do you think about which is to forbid the evil, which is the more difficult part. Because to enjoy what is right is easy. And in general, people do not get upset. In general, in general, people do not really get upset. They do not really get irritated when we ask them and join what is right. Hey bro, let's go for prayer. They might not be praying, but then they might not be irritated with us, inshallah. There might be some, but in general, they won't. They might even tell you, oh, no worry. You go for prayers first. Okay, I will do it later. If we ask them, hey, let's do something good. Let's help the poor. Okay, you do it. Although they might not do it, but they will not scold you. They will, get, they will not get upset. They will not get angry. But then, if this is the easier part, and yet we don't do it, how about what hauna animunka, which is to forbid the evil, which is the most difficult part. When we look into the sirah of Prophet Sallallahu we will realize that our beloved Prophet Sallallahu he was opposed by the mushrikun, not because he is Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, but he was opposed because of what he conveyed and what he represent. And Prophet Sallallahu was opposed not because he enjoyed what is right, but he was opposed because that he is doing nahi munkar to forbid them from associated partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to oppress each other. That is what the Prophet ﷺ do. And therefore, because the Prophet ﷺ is doing nahi munkar and he is being opposed. I just want to remind myself and all of us today, brothers and sisters. I do not know how many people of you are watching right now. But I hope, inshallah, one day this talk of mine will benefit you guys. Those who might watch it years and years later, inshallah. Because I do not look at the numbers of the faith. I look at the faith of the numbers. Brothers and sisters, we claim, and we make a lot of claim, we claim that we are the followers of Prophet Wasallam. We claim that we love the Prophet Wasallam. But do we love him? To make a claim is easy, brother and sister. Everybody can make a claim. Even Nauzbillah, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, the Munafik, the chief hypocrite. He also made the same claim. What are the claims that he made? He claimed that he loved the Prophet ﷺ. How many Munafikun claim they love the Prophet ﷺ? But then, when the Prophet ﷺ command them to do jihad, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they give excuse. They give a lot of, a lot of excuse. What is the sign that we love the Prophet What is the proof? What is the evidence that we love the Prophet We know in this world that when we say something, especially when we express our feeling, our love towards someone, definitely we need an evidence for that. What is the evidence that we love someone? Now let me ask you, what is the evidence that you love the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? This is the same question that I was asked more than 12 years ago. Because I became Muslims in 2005, but for the first six years, I didn't really learn a lot of things about Islam. 
I know how to pray. I fast in the month of Ramadan. I pay my zakat. And that's it. I don't even know what is the articles of faith. I don't even know what is pillars of Islam. But then in 2011 is where I first started my journey. I embark on a journey of learning upon after seeing and after attending attended lectures by Sheikh Husseini in al Khalim. And then I attended one of the seminar, double weekend seminar, organized by Al Maghrib Institute, which is called The Shepherd Path by Sheikh Abdul Bari Yaya from USA, talking about the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. On the preview, during the preview on Friday night, Prophet Sheikh Abdul Bari Yaya, he talked about and he shared about the summary of the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He summarized it in one hour and then he did talk to us and he shared with us about the death of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And once he has narrated to us the moment the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away, he looked at us. He looked at us, each and every one of us, approximately around 300 people, 300 participants. And then he asked a question that triggered me. He asked, my question to you guys is, why none of you shed tears? Why none of you cry? And being a first timer, being someone who is beginner in learning, in seeking knowledge, I start questioning his questions is that, wait, why should I be crying when I'm the one who pay money? Why should I cry? <laughs> There's no reason for me to cry. I didn't ask him, but I asked myself. And then Sheikh Abdul Bari Yaya, he continued and he said, all of you claim that you love the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then when I'm talking about the moment, the greatest human being that ever lived on this face of the earth, passed away, none of you cry. How much do you re really love him? If I were to tell you about a story about someone that you know, about what he has contributed to you, about his death, you will definitely shed tears, remembering all the good things that he has done for you. But now, when I talk about the death of the Prophet Sallallahu why none of you cry? You say, simple. Because you claim that you love the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but you don't even know him. It's just a lip service. Whatever that he say, it's just like I'm being slapped on my face. Yep, I'm being slapped on my face. Not literal, just metaphorical. Okay, just metaphorical. And I start to question myself, yes, when I became Muslim, I did utter the two kalima, which is, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah wa Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness there's no God worthy to be worshipped except Allah, and I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad is his last and final messenger, meaning I have testified that he's the last and final messenger, but I don't even know him. That's why I don't love him. And you just have to imagine me without the beard. Okay? Me without the beard. And then he, he continue and he pledge and he say, he give us a commitment. He say, brother and sister, if you attended this four days seminar, inshallah, on the last day, I will narrate to you the same incident, the same story, and inshallah, all of you will cry. You know why you will cry? Because you already know who is this man. You know him now. And you know what? On the last day, when he narrated the same story about the death of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, indeed, majority of us cry, including me. And Sheikh Abdul Bari Yaya, he did say, if you can summarize the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just in one word, that word going to be da'wah. Ama ma'ruf nahi munkar. That is what he lived, he lived his life for. That is what the legacy that he's left, he has left behind. 
That is what, that is something that, you know, he do that he's not willing to let go. Although he's being offered wealth, he's being offered women, he's being offered power. But yet, brother and sister, unfortunately today, despite nobody is offering us women, nobody else is offering us money, nobody else is offering us power, and yet we are reluctant to do da'wah. Something that is very beloved and close to the heart of our Prophet So if you claim you love him, then what do you do? As Allah says in Surah Ali Imran, chapter number 3, verse 31, Kul, in kuntum tuhibun Allah, fattabiyuni, yuhibukum Allah. Say, O Muhammad, if you were to love me, if you love me, then follow me. Follow Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, and Allah will love you. And in Surah Al-Azab, chapter 33, verse number 21, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Verily, in the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is a best of example for you to follow. Best of example in everything, brothers and sisters. Not an exception. The way he conduct himself, his adab, his akla, the way he interact with, with people, the way he do da'wah, the way he do pol the way his politic, the way he's, he do business, is everything basically. So if you love the Prophet Sallallahu then do what he love, which is doing da'wah. Now, we have come to the half of our lectures. And we have to go to the next one. And the next one is that effective communications in da'wah. Brother and sister, we have to understand and we have to accept the fact that da'wah is part and parcel of Islam. Islam expands far and wide, not south, east, west, around the globe because of da'wah. And just imagine, brother and sister, if there's nobody who do da'wah, your ancestor will not even become Muslim. If your ancestor do not become a Muslim, you might not even born as a Muslim. But alhamdulillah, summa, alhamdulillah, there are someone who do da'wah and reach the land of your ancestor. So, brother and sisters, if you really, truly love the Messenger of Allah, you should do da'wah. If you even, na'uzubillah, if you don't even love the Messenger of Allah, then at least you should love yourself. Loving yourself. Saving yourself from hellfire. Just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah At-Tarim, chapter 66, verse number 6, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanuku anfusakum wa alikum nora. O you who believe, save yourself and your family from the torment of the hellfire. Save yourself. By doing that work. Because we do not want to be held accountable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if, I just say if, if Allah were to help us, help ask us, hey, you, have you do your da'wah? Have you conveyed the message? Why don't you convey the message? Is it because you don't know? Don't you ever heard about the saying of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, baligu ani wala ayah? Convey from me even one ayah. Have you heard about that? Yes, good. You have heard about that. But then, why don't you act upon it? What should we answer? Do we have a solid answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah were to ask us? So be careful, brother and sister. Even, na'uzubillah, even if you don't love the message of Allah, in which I believe you do, then at least save yourself. Doing that work is about saving yourself, not about saving other people. Okay? And to do that work, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Fusilat, chapter 41, verse number 33, وَمَنْ أَسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَأَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِ مِنَ مُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than those who call people to Allah and they do righteous deeds and they call themselves as a Muslim? So, if we want to be called as a Muslim ourselves, then the best of speech is to do da'wah. And when we talk about do da'wah, brother and sister, it's about conveying the message effectively. Okay? And since we have to convey, it's a mode of communication. And Qadar Allah, uh, today and tomorrow, I'm conducting a met a cursus methodology da'wah, which is Talking, and this is a phase two in which I teach the participant, okay, 
I share with them on the effective communications in da'wah. And that will take two days, and even that two days will not be sufficient to make you an expert. But you need to go on the ground to become an expert. It's an on-the-job training. What's more about having a talk of 30 minutes or 40 minutes, and how can we become an expert? No. So when we talk about effective communications, that remind me with the verses that I quoted just now in the beginning of my talk, which is Surah An-Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 125, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Udu'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Invite people in the way of thy Lord, of your Lord, with wisdom. Wa mau'izzati hasana, with beautiful speech. Wa jadilhum bilatihi asan. And debate with them in the, in the best of manners. Now when we talk about hikmah, and this is the point where I need to use and I want to use to talk about effective communication. A lot of people thought hikmah is just about soft-spoken, being gentle. Yes, you are right. But soft-spoken and being gentle, yes, that is by default. But do you think soft-spoken and being gentle and talk gently in the wrong, this wrong situation is hikmah by itself? Is wisdom by itself? Let's take for example. Can we raise our voice against our parents? Now I can see some of you say, nope, nope, you can't. Okay, I agree with you. In all situations? Is it in all situations? Hmm, start to think, right? Now, if you still believe that, yes, it's, it is general that we should not raise our voice against our parents in whatever the circumstances. Okay, if I were to give you this example, which is, imagine your parent is crossing the road and there's a car, there's a speeding car. What do you do? Do you speak gently with them in which your parents is like 50 meters away from you? Do you say, Papa, Mama, there is a car. Do you say that? Do you do that? If you were to say like that, if you were to talk like that, do you think your parents will hear it? Do you think that is the right way and that is the right time and that is the right approach? No. During that time, the best way, the wisdom, is that to raise your voice. Papa, mama, there is a car. Careful, right? We need to raise our voice in certain circumstances. Although the general guidelines, the rule of thumb, is that you should speak gently, gentle, soft-spoken. But hikmah, let me share with you, brother and sister. Hikmah is about using the right word to the right person at the right time, at the right place. Okay, with the right amount, okay, with the right amount, and as well as the fix of priority. We must know what is a priority. Okay, let me repeat myself. Hikma is the right word to the right person, to the right time and the right place, okay, with the right amount, and then with the priority. We know what is the priority to do that one. Because sometimes, brother and sister, we think that, ah, there is a saying of the prophet. So therefore, we can say it everywhere. Um, not necessary. Knowledge is knowing something. Hikmah, wisdom, is about knowing when and where and how to do it. For example, do we have... Um, okay, like for example, do we recite our dua when we go to toilet? Yeah, we have we have the information, we have the knowledge, right? Okay, good. Okay, do you recite the doa of going to of entering toilet while you are eating? You don't, because that's not the right time, right? So, hikmah is about choosing the right word to the right person to the at the right time at the right space at, at the right place, and then as well as the right amount. Okay, 
how much in terms of quantity, in terms of how long, what is the length of discussion, what is the length of communication, and then knowing the priority. Let me give you some example with the balance of time that we have, inshallah. Okay? Now, brothers and sisters, let's take a very simple example. Talking about uh, borrow money from your friends. Okay? Borrow money from your friends. This is not good, but okay, permissible, no problem. Okay. Imagine you are borrowing. I want you to put yourself in this in the, into two situations. Situations number one is that you intend to borrow money from your friend, which is not close to you. Just a normal friend. Number two is to borrow money from your friends who is your best friend best friend forever BFF now will you talk to them the same way will you use the same word will you use the same approach or you will use a different approach let's think before you answer let's think before you answer brother and sister will you think Will you use the same word? Yes? No? Will you be using the same word? No. You won't. If you're someone who has wisdom, you will use different words. With someone who is completely strangers, with, some, with someone which is a, a, a friend, which is a normal friend, but not so close, you will use a very, very diplomatic way. Like, for example, you will say, Hi, Assalamu Alaikum. How are you? How have you been doing? MashaAllah, have you taken your dinner? MashaAllah, how is your work? How is your family? How everything? You will try to be very cautious. You will try to be very concerned because you are trying to break the ice. And then you're looking for the right time when to break the questions. Hey bro, you know what? For the past two years, due to the COVID, I lost my job. You know, I lost my income. So, you know, the situation has been very difficult for me. You know what? I need to borrow 100 ringgit. Do you have the 100 ringgit to borrow me? Now, that is the one of the diplomatic way. But if, let's say, with your BFF, you have a reason to call them as your BFF, do you use the same technique? No, you don't. You don't do that. But what do you do? You generally will say, hey, bro, give me your wallet. Hey, bro, give me 200 bucks, bro. Well, immediately. Without any introductions, without trying to show that you are courteous, courteous, no. You were just, hey, bro, give me 200 bucks. Hey, bro, give me this. Hey, bro, get me this. That. Why? Because you are very close to each other. Why? Because the relationship that we have with our prospect will be one of the factors that we, that we take into consideration in terms of what words do we use. Like, for example, a normal friend just now, we will not call them midnight because we know if we call them midnight and if Nozvila, if they already fall asleep, okay, they will get very upset and the chances for us to borrow the 100 bucks from them is very slim. Whereas for our BFF, they don't mind if they receive a call by, from us midnight, they will know it's very urgent. And they don't even mind to come and meet you or even transfer to you immediately. Right? So, doing that one, brothers and sisters, we think that talking to people is difficult. It is not difficult. It is difficult if you don't learn. We are a communication. We are communicate. We communicate with each other every day. Okay? But when it comes to that one, we have to learn how to communicate effectively. And look at this. Okay, look at this. In Sahih Bukhari, chap, uh, hadith number 1395, Prophet Sallallahu is sending Mu'az ibn Jabal radiallahu an to Yemen. Okay, he's sending Mu'az ibn Jabal to Yemen. And then Prophet Sallallahu told told Mu'az, Ya Mu'az, you will be approaching the people of the book. I will be sending you to Yemen and you will be approaching the people of the book. So, please, the first thing is to invite them. 
to Allah, to La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And secondly, once they have agreed, then inform them that they have to do their prayers. Now, brother and sister, look at this. Prophet Sallallahu is informing Mu'az ibn Jabal that he will be going to Yemen. Now, you have the prospect there and you have the da'i here. Why Prophet Sallallahu didn't send somebody else but yet send Mu'az ibn Jabal? There must be a reason because he knows how to communicate with them. And Prophet Sallallahu have already told him who is the prospect, what is their character, what is their attitude. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also told him that, you know, what is the priority in his da'wah. So when we talk about the right word and the right to the right person, different people, different way of talking, different people, different needs. There is no one size fit all. There is just a general guideline. To do that one to a Christian, asking questions, answering their questions, will be different from doing that one to a Hindu or doing that one to a Buddhist or doing that one to an atheist. It's different. Okay? But then when you, we understand the principle, the guideline, why they are Christian, why they are Hindu, why they are Buddhist, why they are atheist, when we understand that background, then we will know how to choose the right word. Okay? We will choose the right word because we know the person very well. Okay? And then the right timing. When we talk about the right timing, brothers and sisters, because of time limitation, brothers and sisters, there are too many examples that I can share with you. But... I want you guys to keep motivated, to keep inspired, want to learn more, and then we can talk about possibility of having a different courses where we can talk about effective communication in which, inshallah, you guys will love it. You will look at the Quran and Sunnah in a, from a different perspective, inshallah. Okay? What is the right time for us to do da'wah? The right time is not according to us. The right time is when that our prospects are available. That is what we call as right time. In Surah No, chapter 71, Prophet No, alayhi salam, he's doing da'wah day and night. Why doing day and night? Because during the day, there are people who are not working. During the day, there are people who might be available. But during at night, there might be people, people who are not available at uh, during the daytime, but they will be available at night time. So pro the Prophet Noah, he's doing da'wah day and night. And then we talk about the right amount. Just like our this talk. It should not be too lengthy. It should not be too short. It should be just be nice. And I know some of you who are watching this live might prefer my fancy spicy food. But is it a good food if it's too spicy? Not really. Too spicy might not be good food. You will no longer enjoy the food. But if let's say no spicy at all, you might you might think that it's too bland, you know, that you want some taste in it. Likewise in that one, brother and sister. If we talk about drinking tea, drinking chocolate drink, okay? I may make some of you hungry right now. No, drinking all those drink. Some of you might like uh, a bit sweet. Some of you might like just one sachet of brown sugar. And some of you might just, you know, go it with pure Without sugar, without honey, nothing. So, brother and sister, likewise in that one, there is what we call at the right amount. Don't be too lengthy. Three hours, four hours is too long. And you have to determine either the prospect is still interested in it. And number five, brother and sister, is about knowing what is the priority in that one. The priority in that one is a way to invite people to the way of Allah, la ilaha illallah. And so we also have to understand is to forbid the evil and the great sin that Allah will not forgive if someone die upon that state is that when they commit shirk. So this is our focus. But however, there are times that we need to talk about something else first and not about this first. If we are dealing with someone who is hungry, how is there a possibility for them to be able to focus when they are hungry? But if their tummy is full, they will be very grateful, inshallah. When they are grateful, they might be able to listen to you. Isn't it easier? So likewise, brothers and sisters, in da'wah, there is a communication that you know, we can learn, we can improve ourselves. No one is born as a great communicator. 
other than they're willing to learn and someone willing to teach them. So in conclusion, brother and sister, just for our short reminder for today, is that communications in da'wah, and in order for us to do da'wah, we must learn how to communicate effectively. Because da'wah is to bring people closer to Islam. They are saying that, you know, we should do da'wah that get people closer to Islam, not make them further away from Islam. Now, we might do that. We might commit that mistake. Okay? Because of ignorance. Because we don't have knowledge about what is the effective way of da'wah. They might not reject the words of Allah, but they might reject the way you convey the words of Allah. So likewise, brothers and sisters, everything can be learned in this world, the good and bad. If you can learn about something about dunya, why not about learn about something that not only will benefit your akhirah, but inshallah, will also benefit your dunya as well. So inshallah, brothers and sisters, may Allah guide us, may Allah help us, may Allah give us success in this dunya and in akhirah. Wallahu alam. I pass back to the moderator. Jazakallah, Karishi. That was a very uh, informative and very knowledgeable talk. We have a couple of questions that I would like you to answer, if that is okay. Yeah, sure. So we have a uh, first question on the screen for you. What should we uh, do if we cannot answer a question while doing Dawah to non-Muslims? Okay, thank you so much for the questions. It is not a sin, it is not a problem if we do not know how to answer questions. Not necessary that we must know all the answers to all the questions. Not necessary. The best things about Dawah is that we have the guts and we have the courage to say, I don't know. But not merely saying, I don't know. But how do you build a conversation after that? If we do not know the answer, we try to ask around, did anyone know about the answer? If nobody know about the answer, then tell them, appreciate them. There is a principle of communication that what we call as WAP, welcome, acknowledge, and praise. We must look very welcoming in order for us to talk to us, in order for people to ask us questions. We must know how to acknowledge, acknowledge their concern, acknowledge their questions. And we must know how to praise, praise their effort, praise their question, praise how intelligent is their question. When you do that, inshallah, people will love to talk to you. Okay, and of course, there's an elaboration of what is WAP, but it is definitely okay just to answer, I don't know about that answer, but I will come back to you. Can we keep in touch? Then from there, you get their number, and then each of you keep in touch, and you can continue your da'wah from there, inshallah. Allah Allah. Inshallah. The next question we have that uh, someone asked, which is more important, conveying message to non-Muslims or correcting Muslims in the matters of Islam? Okay, what am, what am I doing right now? <laughs> the things that I'm doing right now is that I am reminding fellow Muslims, fellow brothers and sisters in Islam, right? Why? To empower my fellow brothers and sisters in Islam in order for them to reach out to the masses, to reach out to the not yet Muslim. And we have to be very frank with ourselves. We have to be brutally, brutally honest with ourselves. Is that, do we always with our Muslim friends? And do we always spend time with our Muslim friends? No. So, it is not about this is priority, there's priority. If we are with Muslim, then we are reminding each other as a Muslim. If we have the opportunity to go and talk to our Muslim uh, non-Muslim friends, then it is doing da'wah. There is no Islam there. It's only da'wah. Adinu wa nasiha. Religion is advice. So, do not just focusing on one side, which is non-Muslim, but then we neglect the Muslim who might in need as well of our advice, of our reminders. And at the same time, we should not only focus on the Muslim, but we also have to focus on the not yet Muslim who need the guidance of Islam, in which we believe will benefit them for this dunya and akhirah, inshallah. Allahu Akbar. The following question will be the last question. We have that we worry sometimes that we are not perfect Muslims. That's why we do not start to do dawah. What do you recommend that we should do in this situation? 
Very good questions, brothers. And I do not know this is asked, uh, asked by a brother or sister. Okay, to answer these questions, I give you a very simple questions as well to answer that question. Okay. This is this is what you're gonna learn in communications. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm using what we call as reductionist approach. I know there is more technical approach. There's more academic approach. No problem. You can learn that as well. If you can learn it, Alhamdulillah, it's more technical. If it can benefit you, Alhamdulillah, by all means. Okay, the question is, sometimes we realize that we are not a good Muslim. So therefore, we don't start doing that one. Okay? What do you recommend that we should do? Now, to answer these questions is by asking you another question. Do you need to become a good Muslim in order to pray? And or actually, you pray in order to begin your new journey as a, as a good Muslim. Simple. Right? Likewise, do you, did, where did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that you need to be a good Muslim? Yes, there are verses where Allah says, you know, curse to them, woe to those who say something, but yet they don't act upon it. Yes, that's correct. But if you wait for yourself to become a perfect Muslim, it will be eternity before you become one. But that is not a condition. The condition to become a good Muslim is to do what Allah commands and to stay away from what Allah prohibits. If the more that we stay away, can we just, you know, this is what the shaitan wants us to do. Hey, you are not pure. You are sinful. Why should you, why should you pray? You are praying and then the next day, the next moment, you are committing sin again. Don't be a munafik. Wait. Don't you ever heard about the Prophet the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where he say that, you know, when you commit a sin, then follow up that sin with a righteous deed, with the Amma Soleh. Because the Amma Soleh will wipe off the previous sin. So likewise, brothers and sisters, do not wait until we are perfect. Yes, I'm not the one who's, who talk to you right now. I'm not perfect too. But we don't have to be perfect. We strive. We strive and strive to be the best of Muslims. The best version of ourselves. Okay? And Allah ultimately will judge you and me accordingly to our best of ability. And Allah knows what can we do and what we can't do. Okay? So, do not... It's good to be humble. But brother and sister, don't allow that humble to slowly eat you from inside until it demoralizes you and until you have a very low self-esteem about yourself and about Allah. And remember, whoever strives in the path of Allah, as Allah says in Surah al ankabut chapter 29, verse number 69, whosoever who do jihad, who strive in the, in the path of Allah, inshallah, verily, Allah will open a path for them. So, brothers and sisters, do not, just because of our own weaknesses, that we stay away from doing what is right. And we doing, and to forbid the evil. It could be one of the way that Allah will forgive our sin and one of the way that Allah will improve us and make us a better Muslim. And that is what we aim to do. And nobody will die as a perfect Muslim. Okay? But it is in what state that you pass away, that we pass away, that we die. How good? Just imagine this. Just imagine this. That there is a verse in the Bible that say, whosoever who lives by the sword will die by the sword. But if I were to change it to Islamically, then I would say, whosoever who live their life by calling people to La ilaha illallah, inshallah, they will die in the state of La ilaha illallah. So may Allah help us. Allah wa'ala. Ameen. Barakullah fikum. Jazakallah khair for the answer. With this, we have come to the end of our session. We hope that today's session was beneficial to everyone. We thank Brother Fedos. May Allah bless him and all those who are watching. May Allah bless you and your families. And hope that we are able to convey the message of Islam to everyone and we are uh, more motivated to do dawah after this session. Uh, you'd like to say anything before we end the session, Brother Fitos? Yeah, and to all the brothers and sisters who are watching this, uh, I'm not sure how many are watching, but brothers and sisters, okay, you can spread the khair, you can spread the goodness, okay? You have to understand, sometimes it's not how good is your speech. It's not about who eloquent you are. It's about your sincerity and the ability of Allah to magnify it, to amplify it, the message for us. Okay? And there might be a lot of your friends and family who might not be watching this and you believe they need to know this. 
So why not you start your da that way journey by inviting them to do that one. And there's a lot of your not yet Muslim friends and family who might not even know about what is Islam. And they might even know the only concept of Islam is what they watch on TV. And now is the best time for you to do that to them and talk to them and get close to them. Remember, by us doing that war, it's not because we hate them, but because we love them. Because we have the full conviction that in Adina in Allah Islam. Verily, the only religion that is accepted by Allah is only Islam. Whosoever who profess other than Islam will not be accepted. Would, and will be rejected. Just like what Allah said in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 85. So we do dawah because we love them, not because we hate them. We love them to go to Jannah. Prophet Sallallahu says that you do not enter paradise until you have faith. And you do not have faith until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. So what do you love for yourself? You love to go to Jannah, right? Likewise. For why not you love the same Jannah for your not yet Muslim brothers and sisters? Allahu Akbar. Jazakallah khair, inshallah. Uh, we end with the dua. Subhanallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik.